How many times have you flipped a coin to decide something? We do it all the time. There's a 50-50 chance of landing heads or tails. We have no control over it. The result is totally random. Or is it? This is really not a random event. If we knew all the initial conditions, such as angles, forces, distances, etc., we could use Newton's classical mechanics equations to calculate the trajectory of the coin and predict with certainty whether the coin would land heads or tails. Newton's laws are deterministic. Given the same set of initial conditions, the result will always be the same. But what happens if we apply the same logic to an electron or photon? Can we calculate with certainty where we would find them? According to the most accepted interpretation of quantum mechanics, the answer is no, because its location is described by a wave function. And this wave function can only tell us the probability of a certain result. So the location we would measure would be probabilistic, not deterministic. There seems to be an innate uncertainty inherent in quantum mechanics. But is that really the way the universe operates? Is randomness built into the fabric of the universe, or is that just our interpretation? Some interpretations of quantum mechanics assert that the apparent randomness is due simply to our lack of information, information that is not accessible. But if we had full knowledge of all the information available in the universe, we could indeed predict the location where we would find that electron or photon. One such deterministic interpretation is Bohmian mechanics, or pilot wave theory. But another intriguing idea takes the determinism of Bohmian mechanics one step further, and that is superdeterminism. In this video, we're going to look at what superdeterminism is by looking at what sets it apart from the plain vanilla determinism of Bohmian mechanics. Why do so few physicists accept it? What are the benefits and drawbacks? Is it real or is it a fantasy? I'll give you my opinion, but I know that many of you also watch my friend and fellow YouTuber Sabina Hassenfelder, who has some strong opinions about superdeterminism. She was kind enough to say a few words and provide a rebuttal to some of my views about it. You'll hear from her as well in this video. You definitely don't want to miss this, so stay tuned because that's coming up right now. Let's break down what determinism is. Then we can talk about what the difference is when we put the prefix super in front of it. Determinism is the idea that all events are predictable because they are triggered by events immediately preceding it. There's a cause and effect. So if we knew all the states of all the components of the universe at any one moment to infinite accuracy, we could predict everything that will happen in the next future moment, and the moment after that, and so on for all of eternity. Likewise, using the same logic, all current events could be traced to a cause immediately preceding it, and so on, backward through time, all the way to the beginning, up to the Big Bang. Quantum mechanics, however, seems to defy this kind of causal determinism, because according to its laws, identical sets of initial conditions can result in different outcomes. This is because the outcomes of measurements cannot be predicted in advance. We can only predict their probabilities. So for example, when an electron goes through a double slit, we can only predict the probability of where we might find it when it lands on the far screen. The actual spot where it lands is random, subject to a probability, and its precise landing location cannot be predicted in advance. This is what quantum mechanics says. Or does it? What if I told you that what I described is really not what quantum mechanics says? Before I tell you what quantum mechanics really says, I want to tell you about a great new browser I've started using recently that saves me tons of time and hassle, and I think it can do the same for you. It's called Opera. And here's what's unique about it. First, it has a built-in free browser AI feature called ARIA, which can answer questions directly in the Opera sidebar. So for example, if I want the AI answer to a question I might be researching, like what is superdeterminism, it immediately gives me something to work with right there without having to go to other websites. And the turbocharged time saver is that if I highlight anything on a web page, Opera gives me the option of getting more info on it from the AI or immediately do a search on a new tab, or even translate it in another language. This is useful and unique. Another time saver is its built-in ad blocker, which allows faster page loads and less cluttered browsing. 
In addition, all the apps I use most are right on the Opera sidebar. So for example, if I want to use Messenger or X or TikTok, one click gets me there without having to go to multiple other tabs. Another feature I love is that I can detach a video and make it float anywhere on the screen while I'm working on other things. This is huge for multitaskers like me. And maybe the biggest Opera differentiator is the built-in free VPN, which is available to everyone. This is a far safer way to browse than any incognito mode you'll find on other browsers. In my opinion, Opera is way ahead of its competition when it comes to security and time-saving features. You can try it out for free by clicking the first link in the description. It's easy and it'll be well worth the download. Now, back to what quantum mechanics really says. I'm gonna let you in on a little known fact. Quantum mechanics is not deterministic, nor non-deterministic. It's the interpretation of quantum mechanics where the non-determinism comes from. It so happens that what I described earlier comes from the most popular interpretation, the Copenhagen interpretation, which is a non-deterministic interpretation. It basically says that the universe plays by two sets of rules. Before we measure anything, quantum objects exist in a superposition of various states. Their location is like a probability cloud, of all the places they could be. But when the object is measured, the probability cloud collapses, such that we find a particle at a fairly distinct location. The precise mechanism of how the wave collapses is not known. This is called the measurement problem. All we know is we can't predict its location in advance. Thus, it is non-deterministic. But there are alternative interpretations of quantum mechanics that are deterministic. For example, the pilot wave theory, also known as Bohmian mechanics, is a deterministic theory. It postulates that the electron exists as a distinct real particle the whole time and is guided by a real wave that tells the particle where to go. This wave evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, so the end results are identical to the Copenhagen interpretation. But unlike Copenhagen, it is in principle completely deterministic. The wave provides a set of potential trajectories, but the particle takes only one trajectory. In this scenario, the trajectory of a particle only appears random because we don't know its initial starting point. But if we did, we could hypothetically predict where the particle would be at all times and where it will end up. So the uncertainty in this scenario is due to our inability to measure the particle's initial state, which is hidden. But hypothetically, the particle's position is predictable in advance. This is what makes this a deterministic theory. This is a departure from the standard Copenhagen interpretation, where there are no hidden variables, and the particle's position is inherently non-deterministic. And when I say non-deterministic, I mean we cannot predict in advance where the particle will be when we measure it. We can only ascertain the probability of where it will be. This goes to show that you can make any non-deterministic theory into a deterministic theory by adding hypothetical hidden variables. Now you might say, wait, I thought Bell's inequality proved that hidden variables don't exist. If you don't know what Bell's inequality is, I have a video on it here. What Bell's inequality proved, if its assumptions are correct, is that we can rule out local hidden variable theories. Locality is the idea that a particle can only be influenced by its immediate surroundings. This is the idea of local causality. Bell's theorem showed that the only way that hidden variables could explain the predictions of quantum mechanics is if they were non-local, which is to say that somehow they would allow two particles to interact instantaneously no matter how far apart they were in a non-local way. This may sound incredible, but non-local hidden variable theories can still be valid. In such a theory, particles can be influenced by the state of other particles in the rest of the universe. Bohmian mechanics is such a non-local hidden variable theory. What it says is that there's a real particle which has a precise position and momentum, but we just don't know what that position and momentum is. Those are hidden variables. The particle's motion is determined by a guiding field, also known as a pilot wave, that basically carries the information of the quantum wave function. And since the wave function extends to all of space and the particles contained in it, the hidden variables are distributed throughout the entire universe, not just where the particle is measured to be. How any one particle evolves in time is not independent of how the other particles evolve in time. Its position and velocity 
depends on the configuration of the entire system. This is what gives rise to non-locality. Bohmian mechanics is deterministic, but not super-deterministic. Super-determinism is also a type of hidden variable model, but it goes one step further. Hmm, look at that. In addition to being deterministic, a super-deterministic model postulates that the measurement setting, as well as the person doing the measuring, are correlated with the system being measured. In other words, the object being measured is not independent of the measurement setup. Bell's theorem, like most experimental setups, assumes that the measurement setting as well as the choice of what to measure are independent of the object being measured. This relation is referred to as measurement independence, or statistical independence. In a superdeterministic theory, this independence is not there. This allows superdeterminism to exploit a loophole in Bell's theorem. The assumption in the theorem is measurement independence, but since in superdeterminism this independence doesn't exist, the restriction that local hidden variables cannot exist would not apply. So a superdeterministic theory can have local hidden variables while still violating Bell's inequality and reproduce all the predictions of quantum mechanics. Like Bohmian mechanics, superdeterminism postulates real particles with real properties. But unlike Bohmian mechanics, the hidden variables can be local. Bell himself recognized that a superdeterministic theory could avoid some of the issues with non-local hidden variable theories. He said this, suppose the world is superdeterministic with not just inanimate nature running on behind the scenes clockwork, but with our behavior including our belief that we're free to choose to do one experiment rather than another, absolutely predetermined, including the decision by the experimenter to carry out one set of measurements rather than another. The difficulty disappears. There's no need for a faster than light signal to tell particle A what measurement has been carried out on particle B because the universe, including particle A, already knows what that measurement and its outcome will be. Now, you may object to this based on personal incredulity, but it's not really any more unreasonable than many other interpretations of quantum mechanics, and it has some merits which are worth considering. One of them is that superdeterminism can save the physicality of particles. What do I mean by this? Let's use the example of two entangled electrons. The way we understand quantum mechanics is that these entangled particles don't really have distinct properties until we measure one of them. For example, when we measure the angular momentum of one particle, the other particle will have a corresponding angular momentum. It's the act of measurement that seems to determine what the physical properties of a given particle are. There's no way for us to know those properties, even in principle, unless we measure it. Superdeterminism, if true, could fix this. With it, one can say that these particles were physical and had a precise angular momentum before we measured it. But then you have to explain why it seems as if the act of measurement determines those particles' properties. The way superdeterminism can explain this is by saying that there are hidden variables in the particles and the detector and even the person making the measurements that cause the particle to have the results that we found when we measured it. So there's a correlation between the particle's measured properties and the measurement settings and the surroundings. Now I'm careful with my words here and I'm saying correlation rather than causation. In other words, the person doing the measuring can't change the setting and then somehow that would change the hidden variables. There's no causation between the measurement settings and the hidden variables. There's only a correlation. So that's an important point to remember. Superdeterminism saves locality too, since the hidden variables are local, not non-local. It also solves the measurement problem because the particles are real with real properties before and after measurement. And of course, it saves determinism too. So what are some of the problems with superdeterminism? Many physicists object to it because the lack of measurement independence generally goes hand in hand with lack of free will. My previous video is on the subject of free will. Check it out, the link is in the description. If you watch it, I hope you'll come to the conclusion that whether or not we have free will is not dependent on a deterministic or non-deterministic interpretation of quantum mechanics. This is because we don't control quantum interactions by our decisions. 
quantum interactions ultimately lead to our decisions, not the other way around. We may not have free will in any model of the universe. Some object to superdeterminism because its logic, if extended to macroscopic objects, would be the equivalent of saying that if you take a photograph of the moon, your camera affects the properties of the moon. But quantum objects are not the moon. We know quantum objects have seemingly weird properties that can't be extended to macroscopic objects. So this objection appears to be one due to personal incredulity. But there are some legitimate problems. First, superdeterminism requires hidden variables to exist. But no one knows what those hidden variables would be, nor where precisely they can be found. There's also no established theoretical basis that explains how the object being measured could be correlated with the measurement apparatus. So we don't know what to look for, where to look for it, or how it works. Furthermore, there's no testable prediction that superdeterminism makes that we could use to verify it, since it's not a theory, but a property of a potential theory. Unfortunately, no viable theory featuring superdeterminism exists that we could use to test its viability. So there doesn't appear to be a way to know whether it is correct. Some toy models have been proposed, but they're not falsifiable. So even if we could conduct the test, we could not be certain whether the results conclusively support superdeterminism or not. Finally, to me, superdeterminism cannot even in principle be tested because the correlations, if true, have always existed since the beginning of the universe and will always exist, allowing for no variability. The only way to change this is if there were a way to change the initial conditions of the Big Bang, which is not possible. The idea of superdeterminism may be comforting because it saves physicality, locality, and determinism in the universe. But in my opinion, there isn't enough evidence to say that it is a better approach to quantum mechanics than other more accepted ways, such as the Copenhagen interpretation or even the many worlds interpretation. Now, I'm not saying that it's incorrect, but it doesn't seem any more likely than other ways of formulating quantum mechanics, but I'm open to being convinced otherwise. That's why I invited one of the more outspoken supporters of superdeterminism, my friend and fellow YouTuber, Sabina Hassenfelder, to comment on this. Here she is. Hi, Arvin. Thanks for the opportunity. I think that most of the objections to superdeterminism are based on misunderstandings. Most importantly, superdeterminism is not a theory. It's a property that a theory can have. Superdeterminism per se doesn't make predictions any more than determinism does, but you don't expect it to. The point of developing a theory that has this property of superdeterminism is that it's, per Bell's theorem, the only way to have a locally causal theory that agrees with observations. The criticism that there's currently no falsifiable superdeterministic theory usually comes from physicists who hugely overrate the merit of falsifiability. I could come up with 20 falsifiable superdeterministic theories by tomorrow. The reason I don't do it is that they'd all be falsified. I'd be making the same mistake that particle physicists make when they invent all these thousands of particles that no one ever finds. Coming up with falsifiable theories is easy. Coming up with good falsifiable theories is difficult. And the reason I didn't do it is that I couldn't find anyone to finance the research. It's as simple and depressing as that. That said, I've come to the conclusion that it's just unnecessary because as measurement devices become smaller and smaller, physicists will eventually notice that the outcomes are more predictable than they ought to be. Thanks again, Arvin. I'm very excited you're making a video about this. I can't wait to see it. Gotta respect Sabina's passion for this subject. Thank you, Sabina, for your input. What's your input? What do you think? Is superdeterminism your cup of tea? Is it a fantasy or could it be real? If you enjoyed this existential exploration, consider subscribing for more thought-provoking content. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so be sure to leave your opinion in a comment. See you in the next video, my friend.